researcher at Bath Spa University in October, studying tactical wargaming. Uh, and uh, my two supervisors are John Curry uh, of this parish and Cliff Williamson. So uh, in this presentation, um, I'd like to cover uh, these areas. Um, I will give you a quick overview of my research plan. I will then talk about factors in tactical psychology, operational research, historical analysis um, to provide some sort of theoretical framework for what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to move on to talking about problems with gaming tactical combat. Uh, I'm then going to talk about a uh, tabletop simulator um, and using that to do uh, online wargaming and um, give you a quick demo of that. Um, following that, I'll take um, questions, um, but also I'd like to pose some questions to the audience. Um, what do you think is missing or wrong in tactical games? Okay, so here's what I'm uh, planning to work on uh, for my PhD. Um, so produce an analytical history of the development of tactical combat, produce an analytical history of the development of tactical games, um, evaluate uh, the games against um, some model of reality, uh, analyze abstraction and generalization in the game design and um, produce a manual prototype game um, to work through some of those issues. Uh, and then um, how to, uh, to suggest how to make professional educational tactical games more effective uh, and uh, will include example uh, modifications um, for those games. So um, I'd like to talk about battlefield psychology uh, and its effect on tactical combat or our understanding of it. So in 1943, um, a report on lessons of the uh, campaign in Sicily based on his personal experiences, the British officer Lionel Wigram made a strong claim on the active participation of soldiers in combat. He said that a platoon of 22 men consists of six gutful men who will go anywhere and do anything, 12 sheep who will follow a short distance behind if they're well led, four to six who will run away. Wigram noted that battles can be won due to the bravery and intelligent acts of a few individuals, and these same men were also notably involved in acts requiring boldness and initiative. However, Murray in Brains and Bullets has suggested that Wigram's opinions were affected by survival bias, um, as he was mainly involved in successful actions uh, up until the point where he was killed at uh, Pezzo Ferrato while accepting a fake surrender. Mm. And... Um, Ryland and Spate reported um, several similar statements to, to Wigram's um, being made at roughly the same time. Um, I wonder whether they were simply paraphrasing Wigram or whether they uh, came up with these ideas on their own. And you can see they're all pretty much the same sort of breakdown, slightly different proportions. Now, SLA Marshall was uh, Chief Combat Historian in the Central Pacific in 1943 and Chief Historian for the European Theatre of Operations in 1945. Uh, interviews with troops recently engaged in combat in Europe and the Pacific led Marshall to write Men Against Fire in 1947, in which he made a controversial claim that in combat the proportion of men firing their rifles averaged only around 15% and rarely exceeded 25%. This proportion of active shooters became known as his ratio of fire. Marshall proposed various reasons for low rates of fire, including no officer present, no command to open fire, doubt as to the impact of a single rifle mod on the battle, what difference am I going to make to it, no data from those killed or wounded, and trained aversion to wasting ammunition. Some reasons were explicitly excluded by Marshall, the rifleman's experience, the terrain, the tactical situation, or enemy offensive capability. However, Marshall believed that the main reason uh, for this low rate of fire was an aversion to killing, um, a theme which was pursued by Dave Grossman uh, in his 1996 work on killing. And Marshall suggested modifying rifle training to adopt band-shaped silhouettes rather than bullseyes 
and snap shooting and this would build an instinctual reaction um, on the part of the soldiers to fire at human targets. Marshall noted that the troops assigned anything more powerful than the M1 Garand rifle were uninhibited in their firing and believed this was because the men knew their actions were highly visible to the rest of the team. German infantry squads in World War II were based around the MG34 or 42 machine gun um, with riflemen relegated to keeping the guns supplied with ammunition. So the German army had already concluded that this was the most effective use of riflemen in battle. So after World War II, um, Marshall believed that the deciding factor in war would always be the infantry, and so the impact of the infantry would need to be maximised through more and better fire. In Korea, Marshall asserted that as a result of tra the training uh, improvements um, suggested by his research, the ratio of fire had increased to 55%. However, Casey Jordan later claimed that Marshall had been right for the wrong reasons, um, citing the increased use of squad support weapons by the US in that conflict. By the Vietnam War, Dave Grossman claimed that improved training had boosted the ratio to over 90%. However, this could also be because the US adopted the M16 as its standard US service rifle during the war. Um, soldiers may have felt more empowered and effective using automatic weapons and therefore fired them more frequently. In 1988, Roger Spiller, then Deputy Director of the US Combat Studies Institute, wrote an article critical of Marshall's research methodology and professionalism, which has cast doubt over Marshall's claims. Although Marshall himself mentioned the limitations of his research methodology and resources in chapter 13 of Men Against Fire. The argument between Marshall's supporters and his detractors has continued because according to Robert Engen, um, it has been difficult to prove or disprove the ratio of fire with documentary historical evidence. He claimed Canadian soldiers in World War II did not exhibit a poor ratio of fire. Instead, a common problem was that of inexperienced troops firing at the slightest provocation. Rather than attempting to win a firefight at range, troops were trained to withhold fire until the enemy had moved into a kill zone. A low ratio of fire for US troops could therefore be attributed to their awareness of the tactical situation and deciding not to shoot under those circumstances. Regardless of Marshall's methods, his ideas stimulated the analysis of previously unexamined factors um, relating to the participation of troops in combat. Uh, and at the bottom uh, here, table five uh, is taken from a paper by Roland and Spate um, that uh, compares participation rates uh, in other historical analyses that show close alignment with Marshall's estimates. So while it's not easy to back up these claims of variable performance in tactical combat, there is uh, some historical evidence that this occurred in other more measurable fields of battle, uh, which and these show that there's a distribution of combat effectiveness um, for whatever reason, perhaps situational awareness, training or experience. So the top quote there, 4% of the pilots have contributed 40% of the total kills uh, in every war since World War I, uh, although that statement was made in 1973. So um, there probably has not been enough uh, data to, uh, to back that up since. Um, HK Weiss uh, came up with the uh, uh, pilots are 10% hawks uh, and 90% doves in his um, problems of limited war, systematic analysis of problems of limited war. Uh, and Jay Storr mentioned that 8.5% of US subs in the Pacific got 90, got 39% of tonnage uh, sunk. So a small proportion um, of high achievers, for whatever reason, are, are doing a disproportionate amount of um, damage. So 
So uh, in David uh, Rowland's 2006 book, The Stress of Battle, he, he describes many interesting results from British operational research and historical analysis. By combining field trials with 47 historical battles in which rifles were the main weapon um, to get some sort of um, uh, comparing oranges with oranges, he noted that there was a tenfold drop in performance uh, between real and simulated combat. And the table here um, uh, from his um, uh, 2007 journal article co-authored with L.R. Spate uh, shows a summary of uh, these degradation factors. Um, so you can see um, rifles performing um, only a, a tenth as well as they would on tactical trials. Um, machine guns doing slightly better than that. Um, and then you have anti-tank guns and main battle tank um, degradation factors. Um, surprising thing there perhaps is that anti-tank guns um, uh, do quite well. So um, he, he uh, examined the performance of, of these crude vehicles and anti-tank guns um, uh, their heroic performance uh, uh, and he defined heroic as, as crews containing at least one gallantry award winner. And so here, the uh, heroic crews were uh, uh, approximately seven times more likely to score hits than the non-heroic crews. Um, explained by the um, uh, heroic crews suffering reduced combat degradation compared to the hero non-heroic crews. So rather than just being seven times better than everybody else, they were um, much less affected by that degradation factor. And in, in defense, um, uh, as I said, the anti-tank guns got three times the number of kills than defending tanks. And Roland describes this to the higher density of officers and NCOs in anti-tank gun crews um, than in tanks. So, um, you know, the, the boss is watching your performance. Through an analysis uh, of infantry actions, uh, Spate and Roland produced a more detailed spectrum of combat behavior, um, which is shown here. So you can see uh, the, the, uh, the biggest takeaway is only 2% um, of soldiers um, fully participating and being fully effective um, in their weapon use, and, and a further 11% uh, um, participating but not very well, um, and, and the rest um, pretty much um, decaying away after that. Um, so uh, these were for British soldiers. Um, uh, Spate and Roland noted that this might vary in groups with different traditions or trading. Um, and uh, to uh, examine that, um, they uh, had a look at the combat of performance of Gurkhas. Um, probably chosen because they could easily access the records, but also because um, they used British weapons, tactics, uh, and methods. Uh, so very comparable. Uh, now here though, um, Gurkhas typically outperformed British soldiers by a factor of 1.6 to one uh, in terms of casualties inflicted by uh, uh, per um, kill. And Spate and Roland also provided a useful set of comparisons between their um, that warfighting resolve classification and uh, those of other studies. Um, for example, the Humro Fighter One, um, which was a, a, an early uh, US study from 1957, uh, and you can see if you have a look uh, at those various categories, there's there's quite a good um, compare uh, agreement um, with those results. So um, in, in the empty battlefield where enemy forces are rarely seen, uh, incoming fire causes troops to take cover. Uh, in the process, they, they may lose sight of their fellow soldiers. Uh, for a unit to remain functional, uh, Marshall believed that soldiers need to know that their com comrades are nearby. Uh, German and Japanese troops constantly shouted amongst themselves in battle. Um, uh, which ironically was taken by um, allied forces to indicate unprofessional tactical training and behavior. But um, apart from anything else, apart from 
uh, passing around uh, information about the position of the enemy, they were uh, letting each other know where they were and keeping their uh, group morale up. Marshall claimed that the information coming from contact with friendly forces to either flank made up half of a unit's morale and firepower provided the other half. He complained that while information typically flowed back up to high command, it really occurred between units on either flank. So once an, a US unit uh, took uh, incoming fire and went to ground, um, it usually took uh, up to half an hour for squad leaders to regain command and control. And uh, Marshall provide, provides examples, um, including uh, Lieutenant Millsap's patrol, where it took nearly an hour uh, to motivate his men to continue an attack on a machine gun position. And uh, Company G's assault on Kurgunant um, where after a charge across 700 yards of open field, the company took cover behind a hedgerow within 50 yards of the enemy for seven hours. Um, but I think I probably would after charging across 700 yards of open field. Roland and Spate um, refer to uh, Corkill's 1997 unpublished questionnaire to veterans on how they would respond to enemy fire. About half said they would remain undercover for a few seconds and the other half said at least a minute although they didn't put an upper bound on that so uh, the reaction to incoming fire is all over the place so battle subjects uh, combatants to rapid and apparently random change which can cause psychological shock uh, and there are uh, other factors uh, include uh, having to consider how to defend against multiple types of attack. Um, uh, perhaps you have uh, oncoming infantry and, the same, and you're thinking about how to defend against that. And now you come under mortar attack. So, uh, you know, how do I take cover? What do I, what should I be looking out for? Uh, too wide a frontage for the number of available troops. Um, so the enemy may possibly start uh, coming around on into your peripheral vision. Um, the withdrawal of friendly units, um, obviously, um, are going to uh, give you a bit of a hit. Death of key leaders, um, friendly fire, taking fire from an unexpected direction, uh, and the appearance of intimidating any enemy weaponry. Um, Shock can also uh, result from successfully achieving an objective like taking a house in street fighting uh, or capturing a hill, at which point the exhausted uh, victors let down their guard uh, and are then vulnerable to counterattack. So what lessons can we um, take then from um, this, this look at um, uh, some aspects of tactical psychology? So factors that may not be well modelled in tactical war games uh, in include um, uh, the low participation um, of soldiers, um, the uh, degradation uh, of effectiveness um, in combat compared to on exercise, uh, compared to uh, on the range, um, the uh, presence of uh, heroes, um, reduces um, that uh, uh, poor effectiveness to some degree. Uh, uh, presence of leaders um, increases participation by a team. Uh, and no one wants to look like they're not doing anything. Um, the presence of comrades increases participation. You don't want to let your um, mates down. Uh, and also knowing that there is a boost. Um, and the, uh, conversely, the, uh, the low morale effect um, when uh, gone to ground, you can't see anybody around you, uh, the grass is all around your face, you can't hear anybody, you don't know what's going on. Uh, low participation following success, as I've said, uh, and um, flanking combined arms um, and uh, the advertising of surrender options um, described by Murray in Brains and Bullets.
So uh, I'm going to look at um, analyzing tactical war games by considering a review by Paddy Griffith, um, obviously dear to uh, uh, to us here, um, of um, SPI's tactical war game Firefight, um, released in 1976. As it had been sponsored by the US Army for use as a training aid, uh, Paddy was asked to review a copy uh, of the popular new game for potential use by officer cadets at Sandhurst. Uh, and his comments and supplementary uh, material are in Appendix B of the Sandhurst Creek Spiel by John Curry and Tim Bryce, which is um, peeking out at the back there. Now, while, while he had some positive comments, um, his negative comments are more instructive. Uh, and I've broken these down into two categories, um, the game's value uh, as a simulation of combat uh, and its value as a training aid. Uh, and so uh, I'll just quickly um, uh, rattle through those. So uh, he said um, Brecky wasn't modeled. He didn't like the way close combat was handled. Uh, there was an overemphasis on AGM fire and its effectiveness, uh, and he didn't believe that the uh, the game uh, modelled Soviet tactics. Uh, being able to see your opponent's forces on the board is problematic in any uh, manual war game, um, uh, and that, which is one of the advantages of a computer-based uh, war game. Um, but the game does allow for dummy units and unspotted face-down units. Um, Admittedly, though, they were uh, in the uh, more advanced sections of the rules. Uh, with the common use these days of drones for tactical reconnaissance, um, this probably isn't the problem it, it once was. A close combat again is, is limited in this game by not allowing units to close assault one another in the same hex. But again, that's the, uh, uh, the basic game uh, and it is allowed in, in the more advanced options. The emphasis on uh, anti-tank guided missile fire uh, and its um, presumed effectiveness um, was a concern of the time after um, the effect of, or the, the uh, perceived effect of Sagas uh, against Israeli tanks in 1973. And um, uh, James F. Dunnigan of SPI pointed out that the army had requested that the maps were altered uh, specifically to allow long range missile fire as that's something they wanted to emphasize. Uh, Paddy complained that there's no incentive or enough information provided to use proper US or Russian tactics. Um, uh, and I think uh, he, he had something there. It would be helpful if tactical uh, games provided or enforced through combat effects, um, some sort of trained battle drill responses of units to combat events. Um, so the, the trained response troops should operate automatically um, through the game rules or design. As a training aid, um, he felt that um, uh, the tactical exercises without troops provided plenty, plenty of practical training, um, but firefight provided only tactical lessons at the expense of spending a great deal of time learning how to play a heavily stylized game, and that many of these lessons would not be the right ones. So uh, I thought it would be useful just to um, highlight a few other games um, used for military education. I'm sure there are plenty more I haven't included, um, but um, uh, here are a couple I found um, uh, being used to train officers and NCOs. So on the uh, the left uh, is, is a fairly straightforward um, uh, game, the Attack War game um, by uh, Dr. Gordon Cook um, of the Department of Military Instruction at West Point. Um, at, and you can see it's um, it's there are no squares hexes. Um, it's it's pretty much a, a sort of a miniatures game um, without fancy miniatures, and using something that is would be quite recognisable to soldiers um, as a, a simplified map of the type they'd be used to. Uh, and on the right, um, you've got um, a, a recently revamped um, by Ed Farron at UK Fight Club. Um, uh, a, a, a version of Phil Sabin's Take That Hill uh, game, which he, he, he came out with some years ago, uh, and it's um, uh, been given a lick of paint uh, to look a little bit more attractive. Um, and they um, are providing this in a variety of formats, uh, including as an online game um, 
and on different platforms like Roll20. So I've got a brief list here of poorly understood tactical issues. Um, it's uh, uh, one of the issues that uh, I, I want to investigate is, is how communication occurs within the command structure at a tactical level. And what would be useful would be to interview small unit leaders, review logs of radio traffic, if such things exist or are not maintained, uh, and observe interactions within command posts. So trying to answer questions like, um, what do tactical commanders need to communicate? Um, and what do their subordinates need to report? And, and what do they want to hear? It's not clear how well firearms can suppress the enemy. Uh, John Salt provided an analysis of WO2291-471 uh, weight of small arms fire needed for various targets. Um, but it's even they admit it's pretty much their best guess. The actual effect of terrain. So we've been trained through years of wargaming to understand that woods provide, for example, a plus one to a unit's defense, and urban areas a plus two. But do these types of terrain actually provide defensive bonuses to the level suggested? Uh, like the uh, linguistic conceit of 50 words for snow, do, do we need 50 words for a wood hex? Uh, I'll thank John Curry for suggesting that one. Uh, suggestion from John Salt, does body armor actually help its wearer? While providing a measure of ballistic protection against fragments and small arms, it can force soldiers into stances and prone positions that it can increase their exposure to enemy fire, um, aside from issues of reducing or even removing tactical mobility, increasing the load on the soldier and increasing fatigue. Uh, and the theory between uh, behind visual search and target acquisition is not well understood. Although Spike and Roland in their paper modeling the rural infantry battle believed that their model matched results from the King's Ride and King's Walk trials. And now things that are poorly implemented or, or ignored in, in war games. So as discussed earlier, participation rates and accuracy of fire is much lower than on the rifle range. Uh, at Goose Green, the British um, on average took, uh, took uh, 52 casualties over 36 hours. Um, and that is not um, either a, a length of combat or a casualty rate. You'll find it in many skirmish or tactical games. Uh, movement and combat is intensely fatiguing and soldiers are likely to be suffering from sleep deprivation even before combat, which will have an effect on their morale and cognitive processes. Bayonet charges are surprisingly still a factor in model warfare. Um, the last one I know about occurred in 2011. Um, uh, it's still a factor because soldiers can still run out of bullets. Friendly fire typically accounts for between 2 and 20% of casualties, uh, but given this surprisingly large figure, it doesn't seem to be a factor in most war games. Uh, modern medicine means that providing casualties can be evacuated to somewhere with surgical facilities, their survival chances are high. However, the act of eva evacuating casualties takes organisational effort on the part of the commander. Troops may be detailed to carry the injured, transport will need to arrive, possibly under fire, and so on. And in some cases, entire battles have been sidelined while rescue operations or medevacs are in progress. Tabletop games often provide blanket terrain benefits to any unit in that terrain without considering the fields, field craft skills um, uh, or characteristics of that unit. What might be open ground to poorly trained troops might be to well-trained might to well-trained soldiers contain plenty of useful folds and features providing cover. The issue of capturing prisoners and arranging for their interrogation and removal from the battlefield is not a common feature in most war games. Uh, and finally, uh, John Salt had weight limitations uh, on on um, uh, crossing bridges um, in his reworking of firefight called Gunner Sabo Tank. Um, I've not seen it in many other tactical games. Uh, and uh, here's uh, another example from um, 
armor in urban operations. Um, so in the um, first battle of Grozny during the first Chechen war, um, uh, the Russians uh, attacked the Chechen capital Grozny from multiple directions with four armored columns. Uh, they took high casualties. Um, the lead battalion of the 131st Brigade seized Grozny train station, but ambushes concealed in the buildings overlooking the station opened fire with heavy machine guns and RPGs, forcing the Russians indoors as their vehicles were set ablaze. Uh, Russian tanks and APCs could not elevate their guns high enough to shoot back at the Chechens uh, concealed in the upper stories of buildings. Uh, so only a few Shilka and Tunguska AA vehicles um, with rapid firing guns could provide support. Uh, in, in again, in, in most um, urban war games I've seen, you uh, only have one, two, maybe three stories. Um, tower blocks are quite prevalent in modern cities. Uh, don't see much representation of that. Uh, and here are a couple of um, uh, general uh, issues with tactical war gaming. Um, you have got to manage a lot of unit state information. Um, it's easy to get overwhelmed with um, markers, counters, uh, etc. On on tabletop uh, games, it's much easier to manage that sort of thing in computer games. Uh, and when you're trying to uh, move from an understanding of the of combat and uh, creating um, an actual game, you have to um, abstract away a lot of um, that information. Um, it's possible for uh, players to learn the wrong lessons from the, the, the abstractions that you provide. Um, as uh, Paddy pointed out about um, Firefight, there's a, there's a training overhead that goes with trying to understand gaming artif artifacts and conventions, hexes, zones of control, um, that sort of thing uh, can be quite alien to um, soldiers used to um, using normal looking maps um, to be faced with hexes. Um, the, the notion of players taking it equal turns, probably hanging over from uh, chess and, uh, and um, the desire to, to give each player a fair crack of the whip. Um, however, is, is that um, a, a realistic representation of what goes on in combat? Um, there are various issues around turn mechanics uh, uh, and sequencing to, to, for example, fire shoot or shoot fire. Uh, has, has um, uh, been an issue for a long time. Um, trying to establish lines of sight um, on boards and for miniatures can be uh, quite irritating uh, and in board games provide um, a lot of rules um, uh, to, to um, have to come to grips with. Uh, and also um, uh, commercial off the shelf games um, will inevitably prioritize fun over accuracy. Um, so that's something that one must be careful of when, when uh, using COTS games. Uh, and I'd like to talk about uh, odds-based combat result tables. I think I have time for it. So uh, both um, uh, professional and commercial war games uh, often use odds-based combat results tables to determine combat outcomes. Uh, however, the validity um, of force ratios or odds in predicting combat success has been questioned. Uh, doctrine uh, guides the decision making uh, of combat leaders. Uh, the uh, US Army Field Manual uh, 6 0 specifies the minimum acceptable odds uh, for an attacking versus a defending force um, that would provide a 50% chance of success. Um, most other nations' militaries use similar. Um, uh, rules of thumb, um, although uh, they don't really have much historical justification. At the tactical level, these minimum ratios may be uh, severely understated, um, and results from the uh, US National Training Center um, suggest that force ratios of seven to one um, are needed to penetrate defenses of the opposing force. Um, but they also uh, note that effective maneuver uh, played a, uh, a bigger deciding factor than force ratios did. That was uh, researched by W. Moyer. In doctrinal tools such as the US Army's correlation of force and means uh, model, the 
combat strength of each side uh, is determined by summing the combat values of each participating unit, which is very similar to uh, the way um, board war games do it. Um, so uh, this then present, provides an estimate of the chances of success for each type of attack, hasty attack versus prepared defense, for example, and uh, provides the losses inflicted on either side. Um, however, it doesn't um, uh, consider uh, units smaller than battalions uh, and its um, simple summation of values uh, didn't allow for um, the effects that I, I list here. Um, the possibility of uh, enhanced effects from numerical uh, superiority, so Lanchester Square Law, um, combined arms attacks that I've talked about um, earlier, attacks of different types that uh, the defender has to react to. Um, how unit types perform differently in attack or defense. Um, an artillery piece might, might um, have a good attack at range, but uh, uh, close to it, it's not so hot. Um, terrain having unique effects uh, on different unit types. Uh, engagement duration and the impact of supporting logistics units. The over concentration of forces um, risking fratricide and inviting mass indirect fires. So there's potentially some diminishing returns about stuffing an attack with with um, uh, too many forces, uh, and also the um, the combat degradation um, of weapon effects that we talked about before. Okay, so um, now I'd like to um, uh, take a look at. Uh, tabletop simulator and uh, I hope this is um, uh, something that uh, some of you haven't seen before. So uh, the image here um, shows tabletop simulator uh, and I've loaded up um, table three for the Martlet pint sized campaign for chain of command. Um, so you can uh, Subscribe to this and the other five campaigns by um, Petra Fleur from the Tabletop Simulator Workshop page by browsing for Martlet Chain of Command. The advantage of sets like these is that as TTS simulates the tabletop experience, uh, you can use uh, any rule set you feel like uh, and ignore the game specific uh, objects. Now you could create all this yourself by finding individual models for buildings, terrain, figures, uh, vehicles, um, but by loading um, something like this, you get everything in one go. So I, I gathered a small sample of likes and dislikes from fellow players uh, and some online sites. So uh, it looks good or reasonably good. Um, it's enjoyable to move figures around, allegedly. Uh, there's no problem with storing vast numbers of physical, uh, uh, vast numbers of tabletop figures. Um, uh, they're not physical, so you don't have to build or paint them. Um, that would be a negative for some people, but it's a positive for me. Um, the physics engine gives everything a tactile feel, so it just very much replicates the, that, that, that tabletop sensation. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, easy to find uh, and import um, assets, including things you've created yourself. So uh, what are the problems though? It's um, uh, not easy. Uh, it can be not easy to use or understand exactly what's going on. It can be hard to set up games and invite players in Steam. Um, as I'll show you, it's, it can be a little bit fiddly to move things around. So it suits games um, where um, you're, you're moving perhaps groups of units um, based, you know, based as a group rather than individual figures. Um, it's got fickle saves. It's only available on Steam. Sometimes it can be hard to find mods. Um, and uh, if you want to do any um, scripting, um, that's quite tricky. Here's another example um, uh, with um, Paddy Griffiths. Um, so bringing Paddy Griffiths back into it and Men Against Fire back into it. Um, so back in October, um, Jim Ozarski um, produced a couple of YouTube videos in which he demonstrated Paddy Griffiths Men Against Fire, um, which was uh, taken from uh, his um, Book of Santos War Games. 
and it's worth um, having a look at this YouTube video to see the game played uh, and as a demonstration of uh, Tabletop Simulator. So um, at this stage, I'm going to uh, give you a quick um, demo of Tabletop Simulator. So I'm going to drop out of this. So I have a couple of things loaded up here. Um, these are um, various locations for loading up um, different uh, modules. Uh, this is the one that I have uh, selected and mentioned earlier. So I'll click on that. And it loads things up fairly quickly. So um, here you can see, um, Obviously, you've got the uh, the board here, uh, and if I zoom out a little bit, you can see all the uh, paraphernalia surrounding it uh, that you could use. And Tabletop Simulator does what it says on the tin. It's very much trying to uh, exactly um, provide a, a, a physics-based engine um, that allows you to exactly replicate your tabletop games, which has some pros and cons. So you can also um, uh, move around on it. So I'm going to Hopefully this is not going to um, be hard to see what I'm doing. Um, so I, I can scroll and pan around. You can see that I've got various uh, units here. I can um, select the dice and roll the dice. I can um, create a, a there we go, clone. So I can get a couple more dice here. So if you really like dice rolling, you can still do that. Um, you can, let's have a look at the, uh, the board here. One, one great thing is that you can um, uh, have a look at uh, things from the unit's perspective. So. Uh, it's it's a lot easier to uh, deal with li line of sight issues um, here than it, it would possibly normally be, even with uh, your own miniatures. So if I pick these guys up and stick them over here, say. So you can see they, they don't look too bad. Um, picking them up and moving them around can be uh, uh, slightly awkward, which is why I was suggesting that if you can get things that are multiply based, that would be better. Uh, if you pick them up, you can then use, um, here I'm using the mouse wheel to rotate uh, the figures. And they've also provided a couple of um, uh, handy uh, tanks uh, here. So. Oh, <laughs> there we go. One of the problems. Now this model uh, actually has a, if I can get it, can I get it? No, okay, I don't know what's happening there. I was uh, going to show you how you can um, uh, move the turrets, uh, but I can't seem to do that. Uh, and you can see a number of other um, uh, figures here. So you can you can clone all these figures, have as many as you want, but they've got representative setups uh, and everything that you need. If you if you were to try and put this together yourself, you'd be looking for particular vehicles. You might be looking for particular um, figures online, and it's uh, quite a pain. So having something like this all together is very handy. Um, you might have no intention of playing Chain of Command. Um, you can play anything you want to here. Um, there are various other tools like, uh, for example, the uh, ruler here. So I can measure uh, distances um, quite easily. 
like from here to here. So that's quite nice. Um, if you need to do other things like scaling different units, you can do that, but um, I don't recommend doing that uh, unless you're quite handy with it. Uh, you can see here, there's a representation of me. If you were, uh, if this was a multiplayer game, there would be other people um, virtually sitting around the table with their own little icons um, showing any, any um, equipment that they have uh, arranged in front of them. So you've got your own little workspace uh, here to place um, cards, information, tokens, whatever. These bags provide Uh, extra tokens here, so I can um, pull out a token. So that's there, so I could say these guys are pinned. So it says it on it, but also if you hover over things usefully, it tells you what they are. So even if you can't see from a distance, that's an LMG team, uh, it'll handily tell you. And handily, that's a building, just in case you are not totally sure. So um, at this stage, I've taken up too much time, so I will jump out and uh, say thank you for your attention and invite questions. Um, so over to you, John. John, 